Will you, uh, can I cue you up for sharing your talk? Hello there. Hi, Tom. Yeah, I can, I can share my screen. Fantastic, let's just get ready. Yay, brilliant. You've got that. Okay. Can you see my slides? I can see your slides. I can see the, yeah, now I can see them, yeah. Wonderful. Perfect. Okay, great. Let well, we're ready. ready to go at three. Um, and then, yeah, we're, we're off again. I think we're going to get started again and um, just give everybody a minute to get back to your seats. Sorry, we switched around the schedule a little bit because we were running late, but we're now back on track. Um, we won't do the sort of feedback from the breakout session now. I think we'll we'll have a, another discussion session after the presentations when we can maybe reflect on all the different ideas and discussions that have come up during the day. So I think we're going to start with our, our second round of presentations. Thank you very much to everybody who presented so far. And I'm very pleased uh, that we are going to hear from our colleague, uh, Tom Wilcoxon, on eye tracking as an early indicator of Alzheimer's disease. Go ahead, Tom. Hello everybody. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tom Wilcoxon, a psychology lecturer at Loughborough University, and I'll be talking to you about eye tracking as an early indicator of Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is caused by plaques and tangles. Um, plaques are um, amyloid beta protein and um, tau in, and um, tangles is made out of tau proteins. Now these are both proteins that exist normally within the brain, but within Alzheimer's disease, they misbehave a little bit and clump together and they slowly um, spread throughout the brain, slowly um, causing damage wherever they travel. Uh, and um, ultimately um, they lead to um, severe Alzheimer's disease. And as you can see in the bottom right hand corner, they, they damage the brain and shrink the brain and cause lots of trouble. Now this damage can um, take between 20 and 30 years. So Alzheimer's disease might start for someone maybe in their thirties and um, slowly um, over time, you might notice memory impairments before then you start noticing some really profound Alzheimer's disease difficulties. So on this slide here, I've shown what I'm showing is the path that the brain damage takes throughout the brain. So in the initial stages of Alzheimer's disease, the damage um, starts around here in the midbrain. And as time passes, that damage slowly spreads around the brain until um, the whole brain is being affected by, by damage. Now, the reason for this root of brain damage is caused by um, the tau formation, the tau accumulation, so where tau is accumulated. Now, traditionally, Alzheimer's disease was thought to um, originate in the hippocampus where um, tau was um, first starting to accumulate, but more recent research is suggesting that tau actually might be um, accumulating more so in the uh, midbrain area around like the, the locus ceruleus area um, and um, related areas around there. And it's from there that we have the spreading then. So as I mentioned, people in their 30s, they're the people that might start having um, the accumulation of um, tau within, the, um, within this locus ceruleus area of the brain. Now, um, typically we wouldn't notice uh, that we might have Alzheimer's disease until we've got more um, widespread um, problems within the brain um, and we might notice memory problems first. Um, but it would be nice if we could um, find a way of um, picking up um, these problems when they first start appearing. So when people are in their 30s, potentially, um, could we find a way of measuring um, deficits within this um, locus ceruleus area? Um, so on this slide here, you can see the locus ceruleus is here in blue. It's, um, it's got many projections to lots of areas of the brain. And, um, Tau accumulation is thought to start around this area here. Um, so um, the locus ceruleus is involved in attention, cognitive control, and eye gaze. Um, it is involved in voluntary eye movements and eye movement inhibition, importantly. Also within the midbrain is a superior colliculus. 
um, which is here. And um, the superior colliculus has uh, neurons uh, which receive direct input from the retina and respond almost exclusively to visual stimuli. The superior colliculus also contain a population of motor related neurons capable of activating eye movements as well as other responses. So it directs eye movements, specifically circadic eye movements. So the point I'm trying to make is um, one of the first areas of the brain to be affected by um, plaques and tangles is this area of the brain which is associated with um, circadic eye movements. So voluntary circadic eye movements could be one of the first signs of Alzheimer's disease progression. Now we can measure um, voluntary circadic eye movements um, very, very simply using um, the pro-circade and anti-circade um, task. So the pro-circade task is um, a task where a participant is told to fixate on the center of the screen. And then after a, um, a short gap, then a, um, a target stimulus would appear to the left and the right or the right hand side. And the participant is instructed to um, direct their eye movement as quickly as possible to, to that stimulus. And what we do there is we, we measure then the amount of time, the latency um, with which it takes a person to orient their attention. Yeah. Um, then we have the anti circade task, which is similar but opposite. <laughs> what the participant has to do is look at the center of the screen, but now when a little colored circle appears, a distractor, when it appears on the left or the right hand side, the participant is told to um, look in the opposite direction. And what we can measure here is um, latency again, so the amount of time it takes for a participant to direct their attention to the opposite side, but we can also measure errors as well. So sometimes participants will um, look towards this, this little uh, distractor. Um, now, if you and I were to make this kind of, um, do this kind of task, we might make a mistake every now and again and look towards the distractor, but what we might do then is correct for it and um, um, then move our eyes to the other side. So we might glance at it, but correct for it and look to the other look to the correct side of the screen. And what um, Trevor Crawford in 2005 found was that um, people with Alzheimer's disease are impaired on these anti circade tasks. They make fewer of these corrected errors. They don't correct for their errors as um, readily as control participants. So it shows that um, people with Alzheimer's disease, they are demonstrating these um, problems with voluntary circadic eye movements. However, Trevor Crawford did his research on the final stage of um, disease progression. So people with actual full-blown diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, people in their, in their 70s and 80s um, were involved in this task. What it would be nice to do, instead of just looking at Alzheimer's disease, is to see if we can measure these circadian eye movement deficits in an earlier stage of the disease. For example, this intermediate or initial stage of the disease. And then if we had any kind of treatment, we could implement that before the brain damage has become so irreversible that we've, we've already got these deficits. So one population that we could consider looking at is mild cognitive impairment, um, which is often considered a precursory stage in Alzheimer's disease development. So we might have a normal participant showing lots of brain activity, Alzheimer's disease patient with not so much brain activity, and then halfway between, we've got these mild cognitive impairment participants. Now, mild cognitive impairment is a really broad um, um, category of um, impairment. So you might get a mild cognitive impairment um, diagnosis in your 50s or something, um, but some of those people might go on to get Alzheimer's disease, whereas some people, um, they, they get better, they improve, and they return to normal. Uh, mild cognitive impairment might be caused by a number of different things, not necessarily just Alzheimer's disease. It could be sleep deficits or addiction or, or anything. And by treating those underlying conditions, then you can return back to normal. But what would be nice is if we could um, look at um, this mild cognitive impairment group to see who's more likely to get Alzheimer's disease, whereas who's more likely to either remain the same, same within mild cognitive impairment or return to normal. So that's what we did in um, a research paper that I'll be presenting today very quickly. Um, so we looked to see if we could find these um, voluntary circadian eye movement deficits in this mild cognitive impairment group, um, similarly to how Crawford found in the Alzheimer's disease group before. Um, 
And the intention was to see if we could categorize people um, as either having um, a mild cognitive impairment that's more likely to lead to Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment that um, potentially um, might, may remain the same or improve. So within this research, we had a group of mild cognitive impairment participants, we had Alzheimer's participants and older adult controls. Within the mild cognitive impairment group, we split people into um, two uh, distinct groups, amnesic mild cognitive impairment and non-amnesic mild cognitive impairment. Previous literature has shown that it's the amnesic mild cognitive impairment that are more likely to go on to, um, to get Alzheimer's disease. We made this distinction between the two mild cognitive impairment groups by using memory tasks. Um, we used the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, um, the digit span and spatial span, and um, my personal favorite memory test, the free cute selective reminding task. And by using these tasks, we could see who had bad memory, who had good memory, and we could then put them into these two groups. We used a range of different eye movement tasks, um, but I'm gonna be focusing on the anti saccade task over the next couple of slides. So within the anti saccade task, as I mentioned, we can measure the latency, so the amount of time it takes to direct your attention to the opposite side of the screen, but we can also measure the amount of uncorrected errors. So when you looked at a little circle and you're unable to move your eyes away from it. So that's really showing cognitive control deficits, deficits in this voluntary saccadic eye movement. So within the results, we found that Alzheimer's disease patients um, were significantly different from the old participants, the control participants, and replicating what um, previous literature has found, specifically Crawford. Um, but we also found that um, in terms of latencies, the uh, amnesic mild cognitive impairment group as well were distinct from the um, controls as well. Um, and the, there was a significant difference between these amnesic and non-amnesic MCI participants as well. Interestingly, the Alzheimer's group and the amnesic mild cognitive impairment didn't differ significantly. So what this result is showing is that in terms of anti saccade latencies, um, there's the Alzheimer's group um, who have already got this, this um, brain damage are very similar to the amnesic mild cognitive impairment. In fact, statistically, they're the same um, really. Um, in terms of their performance on moving their eyes um, or away from these targets. Um, in terms of the uncorrected errors, we replicate the same exact findings. So the um, amnesic mild cognitive impairment group were distinct from the non-amnesic and the controls, but not from the Alzheimer's disease group. And we can represent that in terms of heat maps. So these are heat maps where um, We've got time along the bottom here. So this is where participants are looking on the screen. At zero, that's when participants are looking at the zero on this, um, X -axis, uh, on this Y axis here. Um, the participant is looking at the um, fixation cross at the center of the screen. And it, if the eyes move upwards, then that's a correct response. If the eyes move down, then that's an incorrect response. And what we can look at here with the heat maps is the length of this tail. So if the tail goes all the way to the end here, all the way to the end of time, then our participants have um, uh, not been able to correct their, um, their eye movements and move to the correct side of the screen. So we can see in the Alzheimer's participants that um, the participants are making a lot of mistakes and they're not correcting for it. Compare this to the control participants, after they move their eyes from the fixation cross, they might make a mistake, but they very quickly move to the appropriate side of the screen. And what you might be able to recognize here is that the Alzheimer's participants long tail is very similar to this amnesic myocognitive impairment tail. And the non-amnesic myocognitive impairment is much more similar to the control participants. So what these results are showing is that the anti saccade task enables us to make these broad group distinctions. Um, so only Alzheimer's disease and amnesic myocognitive impairment are impaired on these voluntary saccadic eye movements. So it suggests that performance, so performance on the anti saccade task was also associated with memory performance as well. So um, we found that those with uh, more anti saccade errors also had poorer memories as well. So it shows that there's this um, continuum. Um, so therefore, overall, it suggests that an MCI diagnosis, so after you first started getting memory problems and you go to the, the GP and you complain you've got memory problems and you might, you might get given an MCI diagnosis, at that stage, it seems that the anti-saccade task 
is able to um, distinguish whether you're uh, more likely to get Alzheimer's disease or not. So it seems that the anti saccade task can be used to predict Alzheimer's disease. So the next ste steps for this research, um, we want to look at some longitudinal data. So the data that we've collected there, um, we also followed up a lot of these participants within the mild cognitive impairment group. So we want to see if those, are, those participants that have improved or um, uh, remain the same, if their anti saccade performance is the same as those that um, had amnesic mild cognitive impairment and we could predict they want to get Alzheimer's disease. So we want to see if those that we suggest might go to get Alzheimer's disease if they have actually gone on to get Alzheimer's disease. But also an important step would be now to see just how early um, eye movements can detect um, Alzheimer's disease. So at the moment, we see that these, there's these anti saccade differences between people with dementia and, um, and controls. Um, and we can also see that in terms of mild cognitive impairment as well, but it'd be really nice if you could go back even further in this cognitive function decline at the preclinical stage. So people in their 30s and 40s, when we first start getting these, this accumulation of tau in the um, midbrain area, um, if we could use these anti saccade tasks to see if um, we could um, predict who's likely to get Alzheimer's disease and really then um, do some interventions with these people at this stage. So um, before even more brain damage has been, has been done. Um, so um, also once we are able to categorize people as being likely of developing Alzheimer's disease, then what do we do with that information? It would be nice if we could um, have some early interventions in place. If a drug treatment were to come along, that would be perfect. But at the moment it looks like um, the best course of action might be to recommend things like exercise. So it'd be nice to look at um, um, whether exercise might be able to improve anti saccade performance. A big barrier with this research though, is the expense of using the anti saccade task um, as it involves using expensive eye tracking techniques, eye tracking computers, which can cost about 30,000 pounds. So it'd be nice if we could reduce that down into smaller, cheaper pieces of tech like webcams or mobile phones or something. Um, and then it would be nice then, once we've got cheaper tech, tech, we could potentially then start working alongside the, the NHS and um, having the NHS adopt this in their practices. But obviously all of this requires funding. So I um, may have to come back to some of these um, if the funding gods smile kindly on me. Anyway, thank you very much for your time. Fantastic, thank you very much, Tom. Um, do we have any questions in the room or online for Tom before we move on? Yeah, the one, one is about um, people with disability who already have the cognitive, um, cognitively challenged anyway. How do they how do they do that? Is it have there any experiments with people with learning disabilities mm -hmm. who are more prone to uh, early onset dementia? Is there anything they, they've done in their practice? Great, sure. Uh, so Tom, um, Tracy's question was, uh, have you done any research with people with learning disabilities who do have uh, a greater prevalence of early onset dementia? Um, and uh, yeah, have you, have you kind of, or do you know of any research of that kind? That's a really great question. Um, Down syndrome um, is associated with um, the accumulation of amyloid beta problems as well, isn't it? So um, people have looked at um, anti saccade performance with, um, with Down syndrome, and they do find um, what you'd expect, that um, people with Down syndrome are also impaired with um, anti saccade performance. Yeah, really great question. Great. Any, any other questions uh, in the room or online for Tom? Okay, well then we will move on to our next presentation. Thank you so much, Tom. It's, uh, we, did, we did a round of applause. I don't know if you can hear it, there is one. Um, and we're going to move on now. Uh, I'm afraid that, uh, oh, hang on. Wait, we do have a question in the chat. Uh, let me see, I could convey this question. Or would you like to unmute and, and uh, ask it yourself, Denise? or you're in an environment where you can't do that. I'll relay, I'll relay it then. Uh, so uh, Denise says, Tom, thanks for this interesting presentation, Tom. I would like to ask you a few questions. Did you find a correlation with visuospatial memory and also recall memory? 
And that's just one question. Maybe there's another one coming. Hi, Denise. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah, good question. Um, we did find a correlation between anti circadian performance and um, both visual, spatial, and recall memory. Yeah, so um, performance was associated with all the memory tests that we took, um, actually. So, um, so we did these. Um, a spatial span task, a spatial span task was associated with anti circadian performance, but also the brief huge selective reminding task was also associated with performance as well. Um, the mocker, not so much. I think we had problems with ceiling effects there or something. I can't recall now, it's a while ago. But yeah, great question. We find both visual, spatial and the recall. Okay, great. Here's the, here's the second question of the few. Uh, that might even be more, but what do you think um, about including the task of inhibition control or implicit memory? So Trevor Crawford did that in 2005. He looked at go, no, go performance as well within the group of participants. And I can't remember what he found now. I think what the paper said was that there, there may have not been deficits, but I can't remember in terms of go, no, go performance. So an inhibitory control task. Um, but implicit memory, I've not thought of that before, really. So um, I don't have an answer for you there. OK, I mean, there may still be more questions. I think we're, we're opening up a whole line of inquiry. OK, Carl, yes, Carl has a question um, in the room. So I, I don't know if you're aware, we're, we're doing some work on some um, cognitive assessment for people with dementia within MindTech. And one of our partners, um, he works at Oxford, uh, Masood Hussain, he's looked at um, some issues to do with um, memory task. And what he suggests is that there's, there's something that he calls a binding error that's related to people estimating the, basically, if you, if you ask people to remember the locations of some items, people who are, uh, have the APO uh, gene, core gene, are much more likely to mix up the uh, locations of each stimulus item. Um, so I, I was just uh, wondering if that sort of visual spatial um, issue might be related to this, this circade, um, you, you know, the anti-circade um, uh, anomaly deficit here. So I, I didn't catch all of the question, but from what I heard, it sounds uh, really interesting. Um, so I, I thought before about looking at and, and, um, and anti-circay performance, and, and I think that could be a crucial step now, isn't it? Because um, it does seem that um, some people are at greater risk than others. So it'd be nice to see if there was an association between um, anti saccade and, um, and APOE. But um, in terms of the other task that you mentioned, I think you mentioned like some kind of visual search task there. Um, um, so I, 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 miss, I miss what you said, sorry. I will, um, I'll send you a paper you, you might be interested in, in the chat. Yes, oh, please. There's, there's a mic here. Uh, I, I was just gonna say, uh, so we're doing some work with um, a neurologist at Oxford called Masood Hussein, who's looked at um, trying to uh, screen for pre-symptomatic uh, Alzheimer's. And um, he has a visual memory task where it, it, essentially what happens is you show people, say, um, a, a few stimuli, uh, and then you ask them to um, uh, choose between some other stimuli that they're presented with, ask them which one they saw, and then when they drag it to the place where it previously was, um, people with that particular gene um, are much more likely to find the right place but drag the wrong stimulus to that place. So there's something that's a bit of a binding problem, uh, which shows a deficit in um, a, a very specific de deficit in visual spatial memory. And I was just thinking that that it's, it, I know it's not entirely the same, but there's something that seems a little bit similar um, to the, the saccade performance that you were you were mentioning. So I'll, I'll find the paper and I'll just send it to you in the, the chat because you might be interested. Yes, please. That sounds fascinating. Thanks very much. I'll send you my email. I'll put my email address in the chat, actually. Thank goodness I didn't have to repeat that question. 